Thank you so much to our band and young people and thank you for reminding us Christ alone, he is our cornerstone. He is our cornerstone. Well, if you're our guest here today, today you're going to get the inside scoop about what it means to be a part of the Adventist church. You see, it may be a bit of an inside talk, but what I really want to talk about is what the heart of our church is and maybe why we are a little different to some of the other churches that are out there. Uh, I've actually entitled this sermon, Why Be a Seventh-day Adventist Christian? And my aim is to get you to all go out to a tattoo parlour and get a tattoo on your arm that says Seventh-day Adventist. This guy is committed, what do you say? Seriously, I don't want to get you a tattoo on your arm today, but I want Christ to dwell in your heart. I want him tattooed in the centre of your heart. Let's pray. Lord, as we look at your word this morning, as we open it and reflect, Lord, help me not to put down others, but to lift you up. Thank you for what you have done. Thank you for opening the scripture to us. Thank you that we can look in there and see you and you alone. As we do this today, we ask for your presence. I ask, it's not going to be my words, but your words. The words of my mouth, the meditation of our hearts. Be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. We pray this in your wonderful and saving name. Amen. It was a social setting. We got together and our kids were playing together. I had an opportunity to talk with him. I hadn't caught up, caught up with him for a while. He hadn't been around and so it was great just being able to be there and simply catching up and chatting. We talked about our kids, how the kids were going. We talked about family. We talked about career and the career move and the career that he was taking, that he was moving to. We talked about his sport, his hobby. I wanted to know how he was going in that. And then I steered the conversation and I said, tell me about church. Let's talk about church. You see, he'd grown up as an Adventist. He'd been in the Adventist church all his life but that is until recently, until he found himself drifting away. He wasn't drifting away from Jesus, but he drifted away from the Adventist church. And now he attends regularly, faithfully, to a church that worships predominantly on Sunday. And so I was there, I was chatting with him, I was saying, unpack that a little bit for me. Tell me a bit about your journey. Wasn't so much the Adventist church, he says. I just found another place where I felt that I belong. And then he said this. He says, why don't all the churches get along anyway? I mean, at the end of the day, do our differences really matter? Isn't it really all about Jesus? And what he has done for us and continues to do. And I looked at him at that last point there and I says, I have to agree 100%. It really is all about Jesus. And it really is all that he has done for us and all that he continues to do. And if a church... Any church doesn't understand that. If a church doesn't understand that Christ alone is the cornerstone, we need to all pack up and go home. It's all about Jesus. I couldn't have agreed more. Now let me say that God is working and doing some great things in non-Adventist churches. We can't limit the sovereignty of God only to us Adventists. Last weekend, I took 12 leaders, up-and-coming leaders, from here. And we went to what is known as a Global Leadership Summit. There, 
pastors and people from churches, from different denominations from all around. We came and we gathered for one reason. We want to lead the church to the best of our ability. We just want Christ to be at the center. We believe in the local church. So we were there gathered together. It was interesting seeing these young people. They sit down and they saw the first uh, presentation. And at the beginning, they could see them go, Oh, we're going to be here for two days and it's going to be lectures. Oh. But by the end, they were saying, Where do I sign up? I want to make a difference in my local church. Where do I sign up? God is alive, He is well. He is well in the Advent church. He is well throughout the general Christian community. So I had to agree with my friend. It's all about Jesus. And the main thing we agree on is so important. His grace, his death on the cross, sins forgiven, past gone, cleansed, freed, a new start. It's all about Jesus. And if we had to take that premise seriously then we have to say, because it's all about Jesus, Jesus is Lord. In the book of Acts, Peter preaches a sermon at Pentecost. And here he tells the people who were there, he says, Therefore let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified both Lord and Messiah. Yes, he is the Redeemer. He is the one who came to save us. And because of that, not only is how he our Messiah, he is indeed Lord. A few verses earlier, he says this, So everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Paul agrees. Romans 10 verse 9, If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. There can be no doubt about it. This is the basis of Christianity, what Christ has done for us. At this Global Leadership Summit that we were at, they grabbed some paint and they represented sins and they just threw it on a screen. And then we sang, what can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus as you watched and that sins were wiped away. They were washed away. It's all about Jesus powerful event and this is what he says jesus you call me teacher and lord and you are right because that is what i am christians from all churches agree jesus is our savior he is the king of kings and the lord of lords i couldn't agree more it is all about jesus which leads us to the question if God is moving in the lives of Christians in other churches and other denominations, why be a Seventh-day Adventist Christian? Why not just be a Christian without those words Seventh-day Adventist attached to it? Why not just become a part of another church? Preparation. For this sermon. I googled the term, how many hymns in the Adventist hymnal were written by non-Adventists? Enter. And I came across a blog written by Martin Weber who was talking about the similar things that I'm talking about. And then in the middle of it, he says the following. He says, some may wonder, well then, if God is working everywhere, why should I be a Seventh-day Adventist? Why should I? This is how he responded to that question. He said this. He says, because this is the only denomination on earth where we don't have to sacrifice biblical convictions that are dear to us. All Seventh-day Adventist doctrines, when and only when they are interpreted properly, are special truths about who? Jesus. Special truths about Jesus. Not only that, they are special truths about Jesus for these last days. I like how we clarified that. When and only when 
we interpret these doctrines properly, we lose our sight of Jesus, they're not worth it. When and only when we are interpreted properly, they are special truths about Jesus. You see, I agree wholeheartedly with my fellow Christians. Indeed, it is all about Jesus. And that is precisely why I choose to be a Seventh-day Adventist Christian. Because you see, if it's all about Jesus, and if it's all about making him Lord of our lives, then we need to make him Lord of all. And the convictions and the understanding that we have on this make a huge impact on the way that we follow Jesus as Lord. Of course, the most obvious and visible difference is summed up in the first part of our name. If you're a guest here today, maybe you're here for the first time. When you got up this morning, if you looked at your calendar, you would have realised that November 2, 2014 is actually a Saturday. It's not a Sunday. So why are we here on church on a Saturday instead of like the rest of Christians on a Sunday? Why do that? Well, it's really quite simple. And If you've got your Bibles, you may want to have a look at this great text found in Mark Mark chapter 2, because Jesus, here he declares who he is in relation to the day that we worship. Mark 2, and this is what he says. He says, the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. The Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. You see, if it's all about Jesus... And if it's all about Jesus making Lord, then it makes sense that we follow the Lord of the Sabbath. And so we celebrate the day that he created. We celebrate the day that he set aside because this draws us closer to Jesus. This special day came right in at the beginning of creation. And when describing the creation week, the biblical account says this. It says, by the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all the work. Then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. It's as if God wanted to make a point. It's the seventh day that God set aside. It's the seventh day that God blessed. It's the seventh day that God made holy. This is so central to God. It's so central to him that when God came down and he says, here's what I want to do. I want to give you guidelines on which to live your life. I'm going to give you commandments right in the heart, in the center of those 10 commandments. We see this. Remember, don't forget, remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. You've got six days to do all your labor And all your work. But the seventh day, this is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. So on it, you shall not do any work, neither you, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male, nor your female servant, nor your animals, nor the foreigners residing in your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. But he rested on the Sabbath day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. By the way, Look who is freed when they keep the Sabbath day. Look how liberating the Sabbath is. It's liberating to you, your sons, your daughters. It's liberating to everybody. This special Sabbath day that God has given us. And he says, here's what I want you to do. No matter what, remember. We live in a rat race of society. Things are going so fast. God says, I'm going to give you something so special. What could God give? A gift to everybody. You ever tried to buy a gift for someone at Christmas? What what do you you buy? God says, I'm going to give you a gift. A gift that is appropriate for everyone. We're all crying out for more time. God says, I'm going to give you the Sabbath. 24 hours where you can unplug from the world and plug into the things that are important to you. Plug into God. Plug into important relationships. God gives us this special day. 
for rest, for worship, for fellowship, for relationships with what is most important. A day where we remember our creator. A day where we remember our origins. Ah, say others. Wasn't this day done away with at the cross? I mean, even though Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath, we don't have to keep the day that points to Jesus anymore, do we? I'm reminded of what it says in Luke 6, 46. Why do you keep calling me Lord, Lord, when you don't do what I say? If Jesus is Lord and he is Lord of the Sabbath, he wants us to keep it. It's important to him so much so that it is right there in his Ten Commandments. I've just started a book. It's called The Lost Meaning of the Seventh Day. And right at the very beginning, it says this. It says, when asked whether the seventh day is undone by redemption, the New Testament insists that the person it reveres as the Redeemer is none other than the, cre than the Creator. Jesus unites the Creator and the Redeemer in one person. And we are to conclude that Jesus the Redeemer is the one... Uh, Sorry, are we to conclude that Jesus the Redeemer is the one who terminates the seventh day, even though it obligates us to assume that he thereby terminates something that is essential to God's own work? <laughs> what, you keep the Sabbath? That's legalistic. How can it be legalistic when we rest? It's the commandment to rest. You see the central argument that is here. You see what it's saying. It's saying, in essence, it is exactly because of Jesus and because of what he has done for us. That this redemption is enhanced when we dwell in his love, when we focus on Jesus and when we keep the Sabbath. Number one reason for me why the Sabbath is so important, why we need to keep the Sabbath, Jesus did. And if we're going to be followers of Jesus, we want to be like him. I keep the Sabbath because Jesus did. Jesus did. And he asked me to do the same. Because it's all about Jesus. So can I challenge you? How is your Sabbath keeping going? How well are you doing with your Sabbath keeping? It's gone off the screen, but Mark 2.28 in the early New Living Translation, I love what it says. It says, the Sabbath was made for the benefit of people. The Sabbath was made for the benefit of people. Are you getting the Sabbath benefit that he wants? How much benefit can we have when we spend a whole day that says we're going to unplug from the world and plug into the important things of life? From Friday night to sunset Saturday, Sabbath. How are you keeping it? Let me get very practical here for a bit. How do you know what activities you are doing on the Sabbath, if they are good or not? Behind me, here on this tree, we have listed five key words that really talk about the purpose of the church. The church is here so that we can grow together. We can grow disciples. The church is here so that we can connect, so we can worship, so we can share, so we can serve. Actually, those five words also help define the purpose of our life. Why are we here? We're here to grow. We're here to worship. We're here to share. We're here to serve. We're here to connect. In fact, those five words also tell us the reason for the Sabbath. The Sabbath gives us time to grow. To grow, you need to stop, you need to rest. The Sabbath gives us time to come together to worship our great God. Sabbath is a great time of worship. Worshipping Christ alone, cornerstone. The Sabbath is a time for sharing. Sharing what we know about God with others. Sharing the special message that we have. The Sabbath is also a time for connecting, for fellowship, for getting together with family and friends. 
One thing we don't seem to do too well, Jesus was always pulled up for this. The Sabbath is also a day for serving, serving our fellow needs, serving uh, needs of our fellow men. Look at your Sabbath activities. Are you one of the people who come and say, Pastor, can you write me a letter so I don't need to do this exam on Sabbath? But then you go, football, some sort of other event. Look at your Sabbath activities. God has given you this special gift. It's one so that we can, in our lives, have Christ alone, cornerstone, centred in there. 24 hours where you unplug from the world and plug into what is really, really important. The Sabbath was made for the benefit of people, for a benefit of having that relationship with God. How are you going with your Sabbath keeping? Is this really what you are doing, putting Christ at the centre? A few weeks ago on Sabbath, I went out to Russell Island, went out to the church plant that we've got there. Had a great time ministering over there. I mean, fantastic. You get a boat ride, go over there, go to the church. You're there in the church, meeting with people, brand new people, learning all about God, learning all about uh, you know, the, the Sabbath and, and uh, other things like that. And so it was, it was really good. It was a great day. So, you know, like I said, caught a boat there and was there and caught a ba- boat back home. It was a little quieter day for me than normal. Normally Sabbaths are very busy for me and that was you know, a little, little quieter. And so on Sunday morning, I did something that I haven't done for a long, long time. Sunday morning, 8 o'clock, I get up and I went to another church. I actually went to see how are they going in welcoming new people? What, what sort of things do they have in place to do this? And I went in there, I was welcomed at the door like you would have been, welcomed again as I walked into, the, uh, into, into their facilities. And then I found a seat, uh, correction, I had to stand for 20 minutes before I was allowed to sit. But uh, we w- went there, listened to, you know, they had people, they prayed on them, they were going to do missions, they had this sermon, it was a great sermon, it was on giving, it was, it was, it was, it was a good event. I, I walked out again, not many people knew I was there, and that was my day. It was Thursday, that following week, when I was talking to my friend. And I said, you know, I, I did go to a church on on Sunday, and and it was great. I said, do you know what I've been doing this morning? This morning I've been sitting in my office, because on Friday night I've got 35 teenagers from Pathfinders who are hungry to know what is in the Bible. And the topic that I am working on for the Bible study tonight is simply this. What happens when someone dies? What happens when someone dies? And so we began to talk about this. And as, as we did, I, I, I began to say, you know what, this is not a minor thing. Because if we get this wrong, this can lead in all sorts of scary directions. I actually think I might have got him on that point. You see, because it is all about Jesus, we need to understand how he relates to death. And we here teach something very different to others. Jesus found out that one of his friends was sick. His sisters of Lazarus gave him a message. They said, hey, your friend Lazarus is not well. Come, please come. A couple of days later, Jesus turns around and he begins the journey towards Bethany. And John 11, verse 11 to 14, it says this. He went on to tell them, the disciples... He says, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to wake him up. (laughs) The disciples said, Lord, that's fantastic. If you're not feeling well, if you go to if you sleep, you begin to feel better. But look what Jesus said. Jesus had been speaking of his death, but his disciples thought he meant natural sleep. So he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. Time and time again, the Bible refers to death as being asleep. I like to point out the story of Stephen. 
Stephen is there and they're picking up stones and they're throwing stones at him. And in this Bible study I did with the Pathfinders on that Friday night, I said, look what the Bible says. As they were throwing stones at him, as he was being stoned, the Bible says, and he fell asleep. Would you fall asleep when people are throwing stones at you? No. The very next verse clarifies and says that he died. Time and time again, the Bible refers to death as being like a sleep. The Bible declares that the dead know nothing. It's not the dead who praise the Lord, nor is there planning or working or wisdom in the grave. Jesus says death is like a sleep. But it's a sleep where one day the Lord will come and he will say, my friends have fallen asleep and I'm coming back to wake them up. See, it's all about Jesus. And we believe him when he says this. Otherwise, there is great confusion and great concerns about what others teach. You know how it all happened. In the beginning, there was the garden. And God said to Adam and Eve, you can go to any tree that you like in the garden, but don't go to this particular one. Don't go to the tree of knowledge of good and evil, or don't go to, don't go to this tree. Don't take the fruit from this tree. If you go and if you take fruit from this tree, you will die. Eve related this conversation to the snake. And the serpent, the devil, he says, if you go against God, you will not surely die. First lie recorded in Scripture. It's one of the biggest. You will not surely die die but this is what happened but the thing is today millions of people believe that when you die you are reincarnated or millions of people christians believe that when you die you go directly to heaven and if you go directly to heaven well then maybe we can contact our loved ones and that gets in a very dangerous spot but worse than that ezekiel 18 by the way says a Twice. The soul that sins is the one who dies. The soul that sins is the one that dies. And so if you've been good, and if you follow Jesus when you die, they say you go direct to heaven. But if you haven't when you die, well then we go direct to a place we'd rather not talk about. You see, believing this, what Satan says... The confusion that happens over death has created a horrific doctrine about hell. A place where people say, if you say no to Jesus, you are going to burn forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. How can you possibly talk about a loving God and yet support something that looks like this? No pun intended, but this fires me up. This really fires me up. How could people get this wrong? So I want to tell you about something. Next year, March 22, right here in Springwood, we may hire a movie theatre yet, but here we are bringing a movie called Hell and Mr. Fudge. It is a true story about Mr. Fudge and the journey that he took about his understanding of hell. I want to show you the uh, trailer for the movie that we will show here. We will have it Springwood on March 22. Teo, can we just uh, watch that? And uh, he's been consumed with this whole idea of hell. Well, this fellow had read some of my articles and, and offered to pay me a little money to study the subject, so that is what I'm prepared to do. Well, I think the death of that Hollis boy really changed him. It made him question things maybe he hadn't thought about. Is he in hell? Is Davy in hell? You see, when you have a friend and then suddenly he's gone, and you're told he's burning forever in hell, that would change you. That would change anybody. Now, Edward, you realize you're attacking the very foundation of Christian religion. Folks are partial to the truth that they've already got. 
What's a kid doing burning forever in hell? Would, would, would a loving God really do that? <laughs> I found a missing piece of the puzzle. It is, it is so simple, I can't believe I missed it. I mean, we have all missed it. Gospel is not about building up walls to keep people out. It's about breaking down walls to invite people in. <laughs> you keep telling them that, Mr. Fudge. Make it your own. This Fudge character's out of control, and I, for one, want him stopped. Can you do that? What do you want to do? Ignore him? I want to take him on. I think we need to send a message loud and clear to all the Edward Fudges of the world that we are not about to let his lies and distortions go unchallenged. Mr. Holloway says I have my own gospel, but he is mistaken. I don't have my own gospel, and I certainly don't have some corner on truth. Edward Fudge, A Dangerous Voice in Troubled Times by Don Holloway. I just go ahead and get right to the point. Edward, uh, we feel that now might be a good time for a change. You're firing me? It's nothing but a lynching, pure and simple. You know, if I had a couple of slices of bread and some mayonnaise, I could make a sandwich with all the bologna here tonight. What would your father say? His father was my husband. To be tearing down the very church he loved and everything it stood for. How dare you! Well, you just wait until all of evangelical Christendom shows up at your doorstep, ready for some, some serious grilling. something, Mr. Fudge. You don't have to solve every mystery. Not by yourself, anyway. Courageous journey, a story about one man who says, what does the Bible really say about this topic? We're here March 22 uh, next year. We're going to do that. Jesus tells us that death is like a sleep. And one day and one day soon, Jesus is going to say, my friends have fallen asleep. And I am going there to wake them up, to bring them back. Jesus wants us to be very clear about this. And in fact, this is what it says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. He says, brothers and sisters, I don't want you to be uninformed or ignorant about those who have fallen asleep in death. This is vitally important, says Paul. I don't want you to be ignorant about this. I want you to understand this. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again, so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. I used to have trouble with that. What does that mean? It looks like that when Jesus comes, he will bring those who have fallen asleep in him with him. No. Look at the context and look what we marry it with. If we marry it with the first part... We believe that Jesus died and rose again. And such was the power of the resurrection that when Jesus comes back, he's going to bring those who have died in him up from the ground. He's going to bring them up from the ground. According to the Lord's own word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself, notice who it is. It is the Lord Jesus himself. This same Jesus says, Acts. The Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God. And the dead in Christ, wait rise first 
After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, comfort. Therefore, encourage each other with these words. In this church, we call this the hope. It is the blessed hope that Jesus is coming again. And in saying this, we say it all points to Jesus. People aren't getting a head start. We're all going to go up together. It's all about Jesus. It all is, is about him. And this summarizes the second part of our name. Advent simply means coming. And as Adventists, we believe it's all about Jesus. And we believe that one day and one day soon, he is coming back in the clouds of glory to take his people home. It's all about him. A couple of years ago, I was at the Global Leadership Summit and they sang that wonderful hymn, It is well, it is well with my soul. And you know the verse, And Lord, haste that day when my faith shall be sight. The clouds be rolled back as a scroll. The trump shall resound and the Lord shall descend. Even so, it is well with my soul. I, I can't remember if they didn't sing it, but they certainly didn't emphasize it. It just wasn't the same. We have this hope, this great hope about Jesus. And friends, it is all about Jesus. And one of the main tenets of this is that Jesus is coming back. He is coming again soon. And I praise God for other Christians out there, but man, where's the focus on this hope for the world that we have, the hope in Christ's return? I am a Christ follower. I believe at the bottom of my heart that it is indeed all about Jesus, and that is exactly why I choose to be a Seventh-day Adventist Christian. You see, I love Jesus, and he is Lord. So what about you? What can you do knowing this? How does this impact you and your relationship with Christ and with his church? I want you to think on that as I share one last thing. This week, 496 years ago, the world was changed. As in a little town in Germany, a guy by the name of Martin Luther went and nailed 95 theses on the door. It's all about Christ. It's all about salvation through faith in Christ alone. It started a revolution. And Protestant Christians all over the world celebrate this monumental moment in history. And as people dug in and began to study the scripture, it was only 169 years ago, the week before, that God raised up another people with a message to tell. A message about the soon return of Jesus. A message that was built on the first. And sandwiched in between Revelation chapter 12, verse 17, which talks about the people of God keeping his commandments and having the testimony of Jesus. And Revelation 14, verse 12, which calls for the patience, endurance on part of the people of God who keep his commandments and remain faithful to Jesus. It's all centered in Jesus. In the heart of the book of Revelation... There is a message that us Adventists say we have got to tell the world in getting people ready for Christ to return. And this is what it says, Revelation 14, verse 6. Then I saw another angel flying in midair, and he had the eternal gospel. It's all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. He had the eternal gospel to proclaim to those who live on the earth, to every nation, tribe, language and people. This good news to go to the world, it says this. He said in a loud voice, fear God. Take God seriously. It's time to take God seriously. Give him glory. Because the hour of his judgment is come. He's about to return. This world cannot continue as it is. 
So take God seriously. Hey, make a friendship with him. And then it says, worship him who made the heavens, the earth, and the sea, and the springs of water. Worship the creator. This message created a movement. It created the Advent movement. It is based all on Jesus. It is based on his gospel, and it's based on his soon return. Worship the creator, the one who made us, the one who saved us, the one who gave us the Sabbath for our benefit, the one who longs for the day when he will say, my friends have fallen asleep, I am going there to wake them up, the one who is coming again. It is all about Jesus. So what do you do with this message? You don't have to go and get a tattoo on your arm that says... I'm a Seventh-day Adventist. But let me encourage you to firmly decide that it is indeed all about Jesus. And if it is indeed all about Jesus, invite him into your heart to dwell in your heart. If you're not a member of this church here, maybe some of the things that I've talked about are strange to you. Maybe you're sitting there thinking, where do you get that in the Bible? We'd love to talk to you about that. Come and see myself. Come and see Kara. Come and see one of the elders. We'd love to explain how through this book, it talks about some of the things that I have mentioned today. And for those who ask to say, yes, I may not have a tattoo on my heart, on my arm, but I have Jesus in my heart. And I believe the things that we've been talking about today. I believe all that. Then use your gifts. Use your talents for the benefit of his church. In our worships, we've got to have creative people to help design our worships. We've got to have the best teachers to teach in the Bible. The best welcomers. The best hopes. hosts. Make a regular commitment to say, you know what? I need to come together. I need to attend. I need to be a part of this movement. I'm going to be a part of this. This is my church. This is what I believe. Attend regularly. Support this church here because when you are not here, we're missing part of the congregation. When you're not bringing your gifts and your talents, the church suffers. The church suffers. I want you here to be empowered, to be equipped, to be inspired, to go throughout the following week, to tell others, yes, it's all about Jesus, but did you know Jesus is coming again? He is coming soon. Jesus has called us to do nothing less than prepare the world for his soon return. What a privilege that is. What a responsibility that is. What a joy that is to know that the one who is sitting on the throne asked us to be a part of this. It really is all about Jesus, the Saviour, the Lord of the Sabbath, the one who defeated hell, the soon coming King. And he who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Amen. I want to invite you to to have Jesus in the center. Have Jesus in the center. I want to invite you to be a part of what Jesus is doing here. I want to invite you to be a part of a people with a message to tell. The one who has done it all is coming back. He's coming back. If you want to be a part of that, I invite you to stand as we close together in benediction today. Let's all stand. Oh, Father in heaven. We just want to thank you for the everlasting, the eternal gospel. 
fact that we can't earn it, it's all about you. The fact that you have come and that you have saved. The fact that nothing can wash away our sins except for the blood of Jesus. Oh Lord, this is the foundation of everything. It is all about you. But Jesus, as we look at this and as with grateful hearts, we say thank you, Lord. And as we study your word, we learn more about you. We learn how you want us to live. We learn how you want us to conduct ourselves and go out into the world. We learn how you want to use us. Lord, we also learn that you have given us a special day for our benefit. And Lord, there may seem no difference between any other day of the week except for this one difference. You said this day is special. So out of loyalty to you, we say we want to keep this Sabbath day so we can unplug from the rat race around us and plug into the things that are important. Lord, we want to thank you for the hope that we have. Because when we stand in front of a casket, we grieve. But the Bible says we can grieve with hope because it tells us that when you come back, the dead in Christ rise first and then we who are alive and remain we get in this great big community to be with you in the air and we will be with the lord forever lord we can't wait for that day we see what's going on in the world and we can't wait for your soon return but between now and then you have given us a message you have given us a mission our mission is simply make disciples so that they can be prepared for the soon return of Jesus. It's all about Jesus. We thank you that you are sitting on the throne. We thank you that you are coming again. And Lord, as we leave this place today, may we continue to focus on you. May we continue to say thank you for the, all you have done for us. And may we work so that when you come, we can have as many people ready as we work together for your soon return. We love you. We can't wait to see you. Please come soon. We pray this in your wonderful and saving name. Amen.